Hi, welcome back to Intermediate Algebra. Today we're doing section 7.6, quadratic inequalities. So quadratic inequalities are not going to, we're not going to be doing graphs, but I'm going to use a graph to kind of start explaining what's happening with these. So basically we're going to be looking at quadratic inequalities, things with a greater than or less than sign instead of an equal sign. Now when we had an equal sign we solved and we just found the zeros. Now we're going to try and find where things are bigger than or less than zero. So it's helpful to think of it as a graph, right? We're going to try and find x values that would supply an answer that is either bigger or less than zero. And if we think about that in terms of a graph, that's the y values, right? Those outputs from the x would be y values. So when I look at the graph, remember all these graphs of parabolas will be, um, well, I'm sorry, they, all these graphs of quadratics will be parabolas, which means they have this nice U shape, either upside down like this one or right side up. And what's important to notice is that they only switch from positive to negative when you cross, when cross the x-axis, where you have a value that actually spits out zero. So that's how we're going to go about doing this. We're going to start by finding those zeros, and then we're going to figure out where it's positive and negative. And so if you have the graph, that's really pretty easy. If you don't, we'll, we'll see what you do. So here's kind of the steps we're going to go through. First, we're going to find those zeros. We need the values where the graph, if you would, hits the x-axis. Because once we have those, we have the boundaries. We know that these are where it can change from positive to negative or negative to positive. Step two, we're just going to test each interval. Pretty straightforward. Um, see, if it, see if it gives us something that is positive or negative. And then we have to just ask ourselves, are the endpoints going to be included? So for less than or equal to and greater than or equal to, it will be, and for less than or greater than, it will not. All right, let's get more. All right, so let's look at our first example. x plus 3 times x minus 3 needs to be greater than 0. Now, this one's nice because it's already in factored form. Um, but So remember, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try and find those zeros. So I, I actually need the place where it equals 0, and since I have two things multiplied together, the only way that happens is if one of those is actually zero. So I get to split this apart and solve these two little equations very nicely. So x plus one can be zero, which gives me negative one. x minus three can be zero, which gives me three. Now, you'll notice I drew a quick and just really basic number line down here at the bottom. I labeled on it negative one and three. And so what we can see is here is where we had our zeros. Again, keep in mind that image that we had from the previous board, we had a prep, we're having <coughs> Excuse me. We have a parabola. It's going to cross the x-axis at those two points. We just need to know where it's positive and negative. So I have three intervals here. I have everything to the left of negative one. I have everything in between negative one and three and out to the right of three. I'm just going to test those intervals and see what happens. What I'm looking for is just true statements. If I get a true statement, I want that particular interval. If I don't, I'm going to throw that one away. All right, so my first example, or so I took the first interval out to the left of negative one. All I'm going to do to test that is just pick any number that's out to the left of negative one. In this case, I took x and replaced it with negative two because negative two is right over here. So negative two and one makes negative one. Negative two minus three is negative five. If we multiply those, we get five, and five is certainly bigger than zero, right? So I asked myself the question, if I plug in negative two, is it bigger than zero? And the answer is yes. So that particular interval worked. That's one that we want. Now, I then wrote out my interval from negative infinity to negative 1. And I used the parenthesis there because I, want to, I don't want to include the negative 1. Right? We have strictly greater than 0, so we can't use that boundary point. Next, I picked a point in between negative 1 and 3. And for that, I used 0 because I like 0 and it's in between negative 1 and 3. So if I plug in 0, 0 plus 1 times 0 minus 3, I get 1 times negative 3, which is negative 3. That's less than 0. We needed it to be greater than 0. So you'll see I wrote, no, I don't want that interval. Nope, threw that one away. The last one, I, I needed a point out to the right of 3. I chose 4 because why not? Again, 4 plus 1 times 4 minus 3 
Is it bigger than zero? In this case, we get five times one, which is five. That is greater than zero. So that interval works. So I'm gonna label that with a yes. And then I wrote out that interval. It starts at three, goes forever out to the right towards positive infinity. And so we get the interval from three to positive infinity. Now, a couple of things to note here. And you could probably pull this off of the graphs we did in the last section, but notice that it goes from yes to no to yes. It's always, well, not always, most of the time it's going to alternate. Okay? In a few rare instances, it won't alternate. So it's probably worth checking, at least, you know, at least look at the interval and see if you think they work. But it, it will usually alternate. Um, if you have two zeros, it's almost always going to alternate. And so once I figured out that first one, there was a high probability the next one was no and the last one was yes. Um, now, there's nothing that says the first one has to be yes. This one could have, we could, it could have gone no, yes, no. And we would have just had one interval in the middle. Um, and so anyway, let's do another example and see what we get. All right, so here's my next example. Actually, my last example. It's kind of a short video. I have 2x squared plus x less than or equal to 3. So again, first we need to find those zeros. Unfortunately, this one's not factored. And even worse, we don't have a zero on the other side. So I'm going to start by subtracting 3 so that I have the 0 that I need to be able to solve this. It is a quadratic. I put it in the quadratic formula. It turns out this one actually would factor if you wanted to go about it that way. Um, but it, the quadratic formula worked pretty good here. So I have the opposite of b, uh, negative 1, plus or minus the square root of b squared, 1 squared, minus 4 times a is 2, c is negative 3, all over 2 times 2. Again, I've said this in other videos. Please be really careful doing the order of, or doing the quadratic formula with the order of operations. Watch out for those negative signs. They will get you if you're not careful, and huh, that's just always sad because it's usually some tiny little mistake that you make that messes everything up, and then it, it's just frustrating, right? So yeah, be careful. All right, so when I clean up this mess inside, one squared is one, four times two is eight times negative three is negative 24, but again, I have that minus sign, so it makes a plus 24. So I end up with negative one plus or minus the square root of 25 over four. Well, we know the square root of 25, it's just five. So now I'm gonna split these two pieces up, negative one plus five and negative one minus five, both over four. So the first one, negative one and five is four, four over four makes one. And the other one, negative one minus five is negative six. Negative six over four reduces to negative three halves, or if you prefer, negative 1.5. That's a nice decimal, so it's certainly something you can use. So you'll see I made my number line. Be careful, make sure you put them in the right order, right? Negatives are always to the left of positives. It should look like an actual number line. So I put the negative three halves first and then the one. And so again, you can see I have three distinct intervals here. And that's gonna happen a lot with these quadratic inequalities. So out to the left, I picked negative two. In the middle, I chose zero and out to the right, I chose positive two. So you can see the work here that I did plugging in those numbers. I'm not gonna run through it all, except to say that when I plugged in negative two, I got that six is less than or equal to three. That's not true. So I am not using that interval. Now, from what we just said on the, on the last board with the last example, it seems likely that since this one doesn't work, the middle one does, but I'm going to check it just because I don't like being wrong. And so I would like to make sure it works. So I'm gonna take that zero and plug it in. If I plug in zero, two times zero squared plus zero less than or equal to three, that actually works because you get zeros less than or equal to three. So that's a yes, that interval is good. And then if you plug in the two, it, it fails again. You end up with 10, which is definitely not less than or equal to three. So the interval that works is this one in the middle, all the X values sandwiched in between negative three halves and positive one. And so it's that interval, it's from negative three halves to one, this time, since we had less than or equal to, we get to include those endpoints. So I use brackets instead of parentheses. So there you go. Thanks for watching the video. Have a good day.